A word about our preacher for this morning. Manon Voice is a native of Indianapolis, Indiana, and is a poet, spoken word artist, freelance writer, hip hop MC, and social justice ad activist. She's performed on many diverse stages in the power of word and song, and has taught and facilitated art, poetry, and spoken word workshops through organizations such as Regeneration Indy and Women Writing for a Change. She's been a featured panelist for Indianapolis-based organizations like Indy 10, Black Lives Matter, Don't Sleep, and events such as IUPUI's 2017 Social Justice Symposium, focusing on the intersections of race, gender, art, and activism. She is actively the mentor match coordinator of homelessness prevention at the Indianapolis-based organization Trusted Mentors, which seeks to reverse homelessness and incarceration through the power of relationships. She's the proud board member of the Fair Housing Center of Central Indiana and has volunteered for organizations such as Life Bridges and Global Gifts. And she is a facilitator and hip hop music instructor for the Kumba Academy. She's the host and founder of Project 5547 Poetry Night at Coal Yard Coffee in Indianapolis's Irvington neighborhood. And in 2017, Manon was awarded the Power of Peace Award from the Peace Learning Center of Central Indiana for her work in the community. Manon seeks to use her art and activism to create a communal space where dialogue, transformation, discovery, and inspiration can occur. And when she and I found ourselves to be roommates at the On Being event last winter, I found all of this to be true and more. I'm so excited to have um, my dear friend Manon here today. So <clears throat> a word about Palm Sunday. It is easy for us to get wrapped up in the pageantry of this palm parade and to think that, um, that acting out the story in a cute way is, uh, is enough and that, that we're over and done with. But we have to remember the context within which this story happened. That when the people yelled Hosanna, they were literally declaring Jesus as king, which meant that they were insisting on God's economy over, over and against the economy of Caesar, over and against the, the policies of violence, over and against this economy of scarcity. That instead, they were declaring the way of Jesus to be the way that will save us all. And so this morning, Manon will preach for us and will... Um, will we'll culminate that sermon in a, a poem that she penned entitled The Paradox of Protest. The Paradox of Protest is about practicing in the world as Jesus did, being present in the world to both the suffering and the celebration, the suffering and the celebration with trust that Christ has reconciled all things into oneness. That's where we're headed at the end of the week. But we have to go through the paradox of protest first. And so as we prepare for the word preached, would you join with me your hearts and minds in prayer?
O oh God, may the words of Manon's mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be found acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen and amen. Good morning. Good morning and blessed Palm Sunday. I am very, very honored and privileged to be here. Um, I do not take lightly um, that my friend Pastor Leah allowed me to share this, this sacred space, um, the pulpit. And so I'm just very honored to be here and had the privilege of meeting Pastor Leah last year at the On Being uh, conference with uh, Krista Tippett, where we, we were deeply nourished by the redwood trees there. Um, and and so so many other um, activists and poets and thinkers who are helping to move us um, forward into this kingdom. And so since we were roommates, we do share uh, a couple of inside jokes, particularly about llamas on pajamas. Uh, so, so if anybody wants to know like about that, you can, you, can, you can see us later. But I'm very, very thankful to be here. Um, and so let's share the good news. So uh, two months ago, I had the privilege and the honor of being in Baltimore, Maryland, where I was presenting a poetry workshop and, per, and presenting poetry for a National AmeriCorps conference. And it was there that I, for the first time, heard of and met um, the mystic, the modern day saint, Sister Helen Prager. John. And some of you may be familiar with her work. I see Pastor Leah nodding yes. Um, but she is a Catholic nun, and she is also world-renowned for her activism in the abolition of the death penalty and her extensive research on capital punishment. It was my first time meeting her, and she has served as national chairperson for the abolition of um, of the death penalty for some years. She also founded the organization called Survive, which counsels the victims of families that have been affected by violence. And so I, uh, and she also had the best-selling book, Dead Men Walking. I don't know if any of you have read that or seen the movie. It was adapted into a screenplay in 1995, and it was portrayed uh, beautifully by Susan Sarandon. Um, and this showed the story of her as being spiritual counselor to two inmates on death row. And so I was really, really struck by her presence, but then and I learned more about her story. I was fascinated that here was this woman, she's about this tall, but very fierce, very fierce, but also very loving. And somehow she was able to enter into the sacred mystery of the mind of Christ. So in 1982, as a young Catholic sister, she received a letter from an inmate on death row. And this inmate's name was Patrick Saunders. Now, Patrick Saunier was a self-proclaimed Aryan. He had embraced Nazi ideology. He was homophobic. He was sexist. He was racist. He is what we would consider a bigot. Um, at the time when she met him and she agreed to be his spiritual counselor, even while others, including her own bishop, discouraged her from doing it, but she felt a call to come into community with Mr. Saunier, who had been on death row. When she first met him, he was wholly unapologetic. Uh, he was not remorseful at, at all for what he had done. He denied having done anything wrong. And, what, and his crimes were horrific. He had uh, kidnapped and murdered two teenagers and raping one. And so he had committed these horrific horrific crimes, but was remorseful, I mean, but was not remorseful. And as she entered into a relationship of counsel with him, she writes about how that relationship would be a challenging one. There were times where she would go to see him in prison, and he would even hurl insults at her. 
In times she didn't know why she was still in community with him, but something called her to do that. And people discouraged her from that work. Her peers, she came from a very wealthy family. Her family didn't understand why she was doing that, that work. There were so many people in politics and society who had discouraged her from doing that work. And yet, she maintained this relationship. She would eventually walk Mr. Saunier all the way to the electrocution chair. She would walk him to the electrocution chair, and hours before his death, he confessed what he had done to her, and he gave his life to Christ. Now, what fascinated me is not just this tremendous spiritual depth and capacity that she had to be with someone who most of us would, would consider a reprobate mind, who was, who was going to be killed by the state for these horrendous crimes that he had committed. But also, what I learned is that at the same time, she had entered into a relationship with the victims, families, those who were killed by Mr. Saunier. She also entered into a relationship with them at the same time that she was counseling Mr. Saunier. So here, this woman was able to hold two seemingly opposing realities. And I thought, wow, that is the mind of Christ. Sister Helen Prejean entered into what I call the paradox of protests. The paradox of protests. The paradox of protests is when we enter into this world and we practice as Christ did. And that means giving to the poor, but also forgiving those who withhold from the poor. That means speaking out for the marginalized, but also loving the oppressor. That means weeping with the victim and also being there and, and praying for the salvation and the redemption of the victimizer. And when I thought about what she had done, I thought, I don't know if I would have had the power to do that. I know that me in my, uh, in my own capacity to feel outrage for the victim, I would have drawn close to the victim's family, but somehow she was able to hold both. She entered into the mind of Christ that Jesus modeled here on this earth. By Jesus, the Son of God, coming and occupying a human body and yet living out his divine destiny, he showed us what was possible. My One of my favorite spiritual teachers is Richard Rohr. And Richard Rohr has this saying. He says, following Christ means that we follow God for the fate of the life of the world. And I think what that means is that we receive all things. We become present to what is knowing that Christ was the great reconciler. Knowing that Christ was bringing all things into oneness. Knowing that Christ has already redeemed this world and that God has already called it good. Doing this, even though Jesus modeled this perfectly, it is not an easy task. It is a task in which we too have to take up our crosses, our daily crosses and follow him. I think about the cross symbolically. We have um, the cross, the horizontal and the vertical intersection. And what I believe is that is symbolic for Christ holding together all things, holding together opposing realities and bringing those into oneness. We follow God believing in the paradox of protest. Jesus' death on the cross was symbolic of the very nature of the kingdom of God that is paradoxical. When we look out into the world, we see what feels like and, and, and what very much it is day to day a world that is suffering, a world that is troubled, a world that is full of sorrow, and yet it is a world that is coming into the full 
stature of Christ. On a day-to-day -day basis, we often feel hard-pressed by politics. We feel our personal justices encroached upon from the highest courts and cabinets in the land. We feel the policies and politics that oppose our human dignity. And even when we look abroad, there are so many evidences for this pain. There's mass criminalization, and there's mass incarceration, and there's war, and there's poverty, and there's genocide, and there's human trafficking, and there's sex trafficking, and there's terrorism, and there's gun violence. This is all going on. We are all being bombarded with this day by day by day. And we often feel what Paul felt when he wrote in Romans 8.36. For your sake, we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. And yet he goes on to say, but in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Paul had entered into the paradox of protest. He had entered into the mind of Christ where he was able to see the hell and yet hold on to the hope. He was able to see the trouble and yet proclaim the good news. And one thing that I love about your own dear Pastor Leah, uh, in, in, in addition to her being this beautiful being and her uh, posting poems <laughs> on her Facebook, which I love, but I will often see her post at the end of the day this question, and she says, friends, where did you find or where did you see hope in the world today? Where did you see hope in the world today? And just by that gesture of inquiry, she is entering into the paradox of protest. She is saying, yes, there must have been challenges, but there was also good somewhere. Yes, I'm sure there was weariness, but there also had to be something, even a small thing, that was glorious. Yes, we are going through difficult things, but there there is also Christ with us, Emmanuel. There is hope in this world. Where did you see it? Where did you find it? One of the things that I will never forget about Sister Helen Prejean, and she said that as she was escorting Mr. Saunier to the electric chair, on that day, and after he had confessed his sins and given his life to Christ, she told him, she said, when you are in the electric chair and they have started the, that process, don't look around at anybody's face but mine. She says, I want you to look at my face. I want my face to be the last face you see before you leave this world because I want you to see in me the face of Christ. And here was this, this, this horrible situation. Mr. Sonnier had committed these crimes. There were the families of the victims that, that were there who were in such pain, inexplicable pain. The state had now taken, took it upon themselves to avenge um, his, his crimes. And so they had found him guilty and were going to kill him. And yet, in all of this, in all of this death and dying, in what seemed like a hopeless, bleak situation, she stood in the gap. She became the face of Christ in this horrible situation. And she said, when you are dying, look at me so that you see the face of Christ as the last thing before you leave this world. And we, beloveds, are charged with that same task. We are charged to look out into the world and look for the face of Christ. When we look for hope, when we proclaim the goodness, when we proclaim good news, when we proclaim justice, when we proclaim mercy, when we proclaim God's kingdom, we are looking at the face of Christ. We're looking for the face of Christ. And in that transaction, we become the face of Christ.
we become the face of Christ. We can even find the face of Christ in our own personal lives, not just the world at large, but in our own personal dilemmas. There is not one of us in here, I'm sure, who has come to a certain point in our evolution of spiritual maturity who has not wrestled with our own dual natures. All of us have may have deep inner dilemmas or contradictions or controversies or things that have torn us in seemingly twos, in opposites. And we look for God to have his mercy in these deep controversies. But we can trust that even within those, God has brought us into the fold of oneness. I'm thinking about the scripture in Romans 7 when Paul describes the very human dilemma. He says, that which I hate, that I do. And then what I want to do, it seems like I can't find the power to do it. He was talking about the very human dilemma that we have walking this face of the earth and sometimes battling with our dual natures. But Christ has even brought us into the fold of oneness. We can trust that Christ bore this same dilemma. I like to say that Christ was a living, breathing paradox. When he entered into Jerusalem on Palm on Palm Sunday riding a donkey there were some who instead wanted him to be riding on a horse proclaiming war he was a living breathing paradox he was born of a virgin yet had no biological father he was in this world but not of this world he came up through Jewish customs and a Jewish way of life and yet he taught a whole new way. Christ was a living, breathing paradox. And when he went to the cross, he protested for us. When he went into Jerusalem, he was protesting for us. And some of us find our own lives to be protest against empire because of our race or our nationality or our, eth our ethnicity or our socioeconomic status or because of where we live, or because of who we hang with, we find ourselves on the periphery. We find ourselves, in some cases, being excluded by the status quo. And yet, it is us who Christ protested for and called us accepted in the beloved. I love those words, accepted in the beloved. I actually think that's in Ephesians 1.6 where it says, to the praise and the glory of his grace, we now are accepted into the beloved. We can trust that Christ has brought us into the fold of oneness, that Christ has reconciled us just like he is reconciling all things unto himself. And when we can be patient and when we can even hold our own dilemmas with patience, knowing that God is reconciling us, we can do the same with the world. We can hold the world with patience, knowing that Christ is bringing us all home. There is a scripture in James that says, let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be complete and entire, wanting nothing. Let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be complete and entire, wanting nothing. When we can hold both the suffering and the celebration, we enter into a deeper source field. We enter into the mind of Christ. We enter into the paradox of protest. Throughout history, I can think of several people who we all know and who we can all remember that were symbols of the paradox of protest when we think of Dr. Martin Luther King, who preached nonviolence among very violent times, who relentlessly fought for civil rights and yet never strayed from the message of love. 
He never, he never perpetrated violence, even though that was what he was experiencing, even though that was what the black community was experiencing. He held out for the good. He still fought um, um, against that which was not, but he held out for the good. I think of people like Mother Teresa, who served the poorest of the poor, even when she felt a deep depression, even when she often question, God, where are you in all of this? She still, she still served. She still was faithful. She still trusted in the goodness of God and proclaimed that in the world, even amidst suffering. I think of people like Nelson Mandela, an anti-apartheid revolutionary, after 27 years of being imprisoned, and some of us could have formed a bitter heart at that and said, I'm done. But when he left prison, he had forgiven those who had tortured him. He had forgiven those who had imprisoned them. And he went on to preach and to talk about reconciliation and to be a servant of South Africa and of the world. I even think about people like Anne Frank. I just went to see um, um, a play about her story about two weeks ago. And at the end, it says that when they found her journal, so even when she, she and her family were living very much under the threat of Nazism, that every day they were afraid that they were going to be dragged away and tortured and taken to the concentration camps, which is what ultimately would happen. But in her journal, she wrote, even with what's going on, I still believe that humans are good at heart. She entered into the paradox of protest. She proclaimed the hope amidst the sorrow and the suffering. She proclaimed what was good, and we can do that as well. It is our task. We are charged with holding that same paradox. I would like to recite a spoken word poem um, that I wrote some time ago about Jesus entering into our questions, about him very much taking on our dilemmas, about him very much taking on our whys. When we look out into the world and we ask why so much suffering and why my own suffering, we remember that when Christ entered into Jerusalem, he was very much aware of the state of the world. He was very much aware of the brokenness, and yet he proclaimed the blessing. And I would like to remind you of that with this, with this spoken word piece. It does not have a title like many. Hmm. Now from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon the land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? At this moment in history, we see Christ not just as sovereign, but as suffering servant, hanging his head upon a wooden cross, vinegar-tinged lips, side split, hands and feet pierced and blood dripped, arms open to a world that would give him up. And before he does the same with his own ghost, questions the very father who sent him, whose name and fame he proclaimed who said, when you see him, you see me, and we are one in the same. Jesus, the Son of God, asks, why? Can you hear the weight of his weariness? Why? Can you hear the burden of his bewilderment? Why? Can you hear his voice cracked under the violence of his torturers? Why? Can you hear the agony of his perceived abandonment. Why? Can you hear his own voice and yours? Where are you, God, when I need you most?
earlier, earlier in the Garden of Gethsemane, we had thought that he had made peace with this sacrifice when he professed, not my will, but thine will be done. But suddenly the Son of Man becomes undone under the weight of all that he would have to overcome. And I know that we have been traditionally taught to maybe never question God, but even Jesus in this moment cannot help but ask why. Perhaps it was there when the mystery unfolds that Christ takes on the helplessness of all of our daunting questions and wraps them into his own. Christ becomes us, enters into our frail human frame to feel the depths of our agony, our torment, and our pain, and we become part of the exchange when Christ robes himself in these rags of humanity. This humanity that hurts, that cries, that bleeds, that weeps, that is why he said when you are weak, you really are strong. Because whatever you are going through, to that place I have already gone. I was there taking it on. I heard your cry. I took on your deepest questions. I heard your why. I took on your deepest questions. I am near to you brokenhearted. Don't you know that your pain attracts my presence? You recall the story when it says that Jesus wept. Beloved, I wept not because I did not have the power to raise Lazarus from death. No, I wept because Mary wept. I wept because my friends wept. I wept because I am the high priest who heals but who also feels I am in touch with the feelings of your every infirmity like a mother hearing her child cry what concerns you concerns me I wept not just because I'm sovereign but because I am the Christ who suffers with you in sickness and in sadness who sits close I am with you in all things, Emmanuel. This life that I have promised you of suffering and celebration is still a life where you live more abundantly. And I have called you accepted and you are one with me. Beloveds, this is Palm Sunday. This is Protest Sunday, and we remember Christ as he entered into Jerusalem on a donkey, protesting for us, entering into the paradox of protest, where he knew the brokenness, where he knew what he was going to suffer. And just a week later, like your pastor Leah said, that he would be killed. And yet, he was able to hold both the suffering and the love. And on this Palm Sunday, we remember that we are being reconciled into oneness. We remember that this world of suffering is being reconciled into oneness. And that death is not the final thing that death is but change, that we are being brought into something wholly new, which we call the kingdom of God. On this Palm Sunday, we remember in the book of Genesis when God called us good and we proclaim that yes, God is good. Blessings. Mm -hmm.